Well, I'm very happy to be able to say that we've managed to track down Beaver Shaw, one of the celebrated um, gunner techs of the Rhodesian Air Force, and author of um, this excellent book, Chopper Tech, um, A Gunner's Reflection of Fire Force Operations in Rhodesia, um, which has proved extremely popular and um, a lot of Beaver stories are in there, but um, he can help tell us more about what I think was arguably one of the great small air forces of the world. Um, this is a, a force that operated with some obsolete equipment, um, very little state of the art, um, but punched way above its weight thanks to uh, some brilliant pilots who were, who were superb under fire, uh, incredible map readers, and uh, backed up by technicians who were in a class of their own. And their uh, record of keeping aircraft flying under the most adverse conditions is a, is a lesson for any aviator anywhere in the world, I believe. Eva, welcome. Thank you. Man, and uh, I know you don't like talking about yourself, <laughs> but just tell us a little bit about where it all started, where you were born, um, and your journey to the Air Force. Okay, and this, yeah, um, well, I'm sitting here today um, on behalf of all the guys on the 7th Squadron. Mm. I went to Fort Victoria High School. Um, my father lived in Fort Vic and he was uh, um, worked for the veterinary department and <clears throat> and uh, I went to school in the Lowfeld and spent lots of my time in the Rhodesian bush as a kid running around just like most of the other guys that you've, had, you've interviewed mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. um, I come from third generation pioneer stock. My father, my father was in the SAS in Malaya with um, General Walls and Reed Daly mm -hmm. and uh, my grandfather <coughs> fought in the First World War in, uh, in a uh, few of the battles and uh, he was with the South African in Infantry and um, in, one, in one of the b battles uh, there were 5,000 South Africans and I think 400 of them came out and when, when, the, when the war ended, they were repatriated to Cape Town and Grandad uh, decided that he never wanted to know anything about war again. Handed in all his medals and he walked from Cape Town back to Rhodesia because he wanted to think about war. After school, I joined Julie's as a motor car me mechanic apprentice and, uh, and I uh, did about a year as a motor, motor Mac Appy in Bulawayo Tech College and while I was in Tech College there's an advert saying join the Rhodesian Air Force and you'll get paid $125 a month. <laughs> in those days I earned $14.15 a, 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 a week salary so I thought that this would be quite a big boost to my <laughs> income. So, Instead of closing down my apprenticeship and everything, I've, I, uh, I snuck away from Tech College. I had no money at all. I managed to get to Gwilla. I got to Gwilla and I went to the, just outside the Gwilla police station. And <clears throat> I needed to phone my folks for some money to try and get me to Salisbury for, for, the, for the interview. And uh, when I got to, to the te to the little telephone booth, I, I I put some money in and I tried to call them. There was no answer, and I, I was getting frustrated because I was running out of money. And I was, there's a there's a button B where you can uh, get push to get your money back in, and I pushed button B, and a whole lot of money came out. And I kept carried on pushing but button B <laughs> until I finished. Uh, I emptied the whole telephone out, and that got me. I never needed to phone my folks or anything and that got me to Salisbury 
where I was put into RLR barracks for a couple of nights and I, I, I went through my interview with the Air Force, passed it, and I joined the Air Force without resigning from Julie's, which got me into a lot of trouble later, but the Air Force managed to, uh, smooth, to smooth things over. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was my start with the Air Force. Um, it, it was one of the most fantastic experiences of anybody's life. You started on jets, jet engines. I started off um, in ERS, overhauling uh, Avon 1 engines. And then I got transferred to um, another section where we, we are overall goblin engines for the vampires. Right. And uh, yeah, there, there was good days. It was uh, in the early 70s before the war really uh, got off and yeah. it was a wonderful life in Rhodesia. Yes. Um, our, uh, those days before the war and when Rhodesia was still going into the war, it, uh, you couldn't beat the life. Yeah, it's pretty much like Kenya. <laughs> and you did you did five years initially. You had a five I did. year contract. <clears throat> yes, and then after ERS, I got posted to Six Squadron, which uh, was which was in Gwela, in uh, Thornhill, which and on Provost. Provost, that's right. Yes, and uh, um, I went through I went through uh, two two PTCs, and both basically all the pilots. That we train, that we help train as engineers, and, and saw them go through their, their pilot training, mm -hmm. ended up on Seven Squadron with us. Uh, it, it was it was great, and uh, there were some fantastic people. Uh, I, I have utmost respect for them. Beaver, uh, you went on to Seven Squadron after your first five-year contract expired. Yes. What happened is. Um, <clears throat> After my, as my contract was coming up, um, I was going to leave and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Everybody was going to South Africa. Uh, we, we couldn't go anywhere with our passports in those days anyway, so I was a bit <laughs> stuck to as to what to do. And uh, one of our warrant officers, a guy called Bill, uh, Jim Ritchie, um, convinced me to stay on in the Air Force and uh, I, I went and did a, uh, an engine, uh, engine airframe course, uh, writing uh, civvy exams and stuff to get us qualified after we left the Air Force, uh, which was really great. And then while we were doing our course, uh, Forster, uh, there, there were South Africans Second assisting, time. there were South Africans assisting the Rhodesians at that time with helicopters with the South African police under the label of Op Polo. Right. Uh, Forster pulled, uh, when Forster and Kissinger uh, uh, put pressure on Ian Smith, they, they, they pulled, they, all, they the pulled all their, their, their um, crew, their the helicopter crew. crews mm. and, and, and personnel out overnight. But they basically arrived in aircraft C-130s, I think, put them in the aircraft and left. They left their toolboxes and everything right where they were working with the aircraft. And we just finished our course and um, a guy called Rob Bloomers came to us and asked us if we wanted to, any of us wanted to go into 7 Squadron. I mean, it was every young airman's dream to be on 7 Squadron, but there was no chance of us getting on there because you had to at least have done seven years and in, in five to seven years in the Air Force and you had to have lots of experience and you had to be a sergeant. Well, we went in as, as SACs, which is the same equivalent as the Lance Corporal, and we did our course and um, um, we got thrown into the bush. Okay, Beaver, so now you're, uh, you're in 7th Squadron and the war is escalating and um, it's, it's action, action time. Uh, how, how, tell me about the beginning, how, how to, well, your first operational flight. I think the best way to tell you is that the first, the first bush trip that I ever did was probably the most, one of the most action packed of, of, of the lot. I, I got thrown right into the, the deep end. Um, it started off by me going to air movements on a Wednesday, because every Wednesday 
the fire force would, would change. We, did, we normally did a two week stint and uh, Wednesday was change over day. So I went to air movements, booked in, jumped on the deck and uh, when I was on the deck I, I was with a, a, a colleague, um, Finch Bellringer, and Finch had, Finch had um, Finch was just a little bit ahead of me and uh, he, he, he'd done a few bush trips and I was sitting next to Finch and I noticed that in front of him there was a, a, a helicopter tail rotor the whole assembly. So I, be, being a new guy and, and also knowing that I'm going to the bush and this could happen to me, I could end up having to change the tail rotor. Um, I, I asked him questions. I said, yeah, Finch, have, have you changed the tail rotor before? Um, he sort of, oh, it's not that difficult, just read the book, uh, this is what you do, it's not, it's, it's easy. Anyway, we had a little chat there and uh, little did I know that the Finch and this Finch incident would stick with me for the, the rest of my life because what happened is we dropped Finch off at Rutenga and uh, the deck carried on and it went off to uh, it went off to Cherezi and when we got to Cherezi uh, I unpacked and got to wasn't sure, guys showed me where, where our rooms were and everything, went to my room and got, got everything ready then went to the helicopter and started having a good look around the helicopter trying to familiarize myself with the guns and everything because everything's still new to me and uh, the siren went off and everybody, pilots ran off to the ops room and the engineers pulled all the covers off their guns, got ready. The, uh, at, the, at that time it was actually the SAS um, who were standing in uh, as fire force because RLI were going away for Christmas. And, um, RLI had done a very long stint and they were tired and the SAS had been in the Russian front and they, they uh, Graham Wilson said that they'd stand in for a, for a couple of weeks as fire force which is not normally an SAS role. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, the Willie Knight came out and none of the other pilots came out and Willie, Willie said to me, look, this is, it's not a, a, it's not a fire force call out but you're going to have to be on your toes now, we're going, we, we, we're going to do uh, we're going to do a hot extraction type um, Kazovac and uh, jumped in the helicopter, took off and we flew and flew and, uh, and I'm looking and I'm looking and wondering where are we going to go now and from my young days uh, 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 with my father in the veteran department I knew the area very well and I could see us going past Tweezer, Bodhi all those places and getting, and then I saw the Gonorajo and Malapati coming up and uh, Palfrey store and all these places that I used to know and I, I said to Willie, are we crossing the border? You know, I'm not allowed to cross the border. Because you were too, too junior. Yes. Yeah. So he said, well, I guess there's, you're no longer a junior because when you cross that border, you, you now got your colours. And then they come up with all their codes, G car, G cars going, going Alpha, Bob Bravo, and I'm trying to get all these. You know, and everything's in shackle and code, and uh, and uh, we're flying and flying, and we get to the power lines in Mozambique. You remember the big power? Yes, the big, we flew under the power lines because we didn't want to uh, um, show ourselves, mm -hmm. and that was like a first for me, flying under power lines because our we, as engineers, we were always told to look out for power lines, mm. and I'm keep keeping on saying power lines, 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 and I'm thinking he's going to go up and we go under. So <laughs> it was something else. And then, then, then he, we uh, we had a Lynx giving us Telstar, and the Lynx was relaying from the call sign. We couldn't hear the call sign, but we could hear the the Lynx, and the, and uh, the Lynx was relaying that whatever happens, we need to be very sharp because it's it's a real hot extraction. The Freddies are the Freddies are like uh, um, hot pursuit. They are very close behind. They were they were they'd been tracking them for three these guys for three days, and one of the guys had got black black water fever, 
and the, the guards were carrying him on his on his um, poncho, and we we <clears throat> we landed, threw him on board. And there was just who, who were these guards? Salus guards. Uh, uh, sorry, it was a Salus guard. Okay. All son. There was, uh, if I recall, four of them. Right. I saw four of the four of them, and uh, we. I think we actually pulled the whole call sign out because they'd been compromised and we, right. we flew to Palfrey store, landed at Palfrey store and the medic, the medic was doing all the, doing all the, um, his, his stuff on this guy and he, he was in a real, real bad way and uh, I, I, the first time I'd ever actually seen a real salute scout in all his glory and smell. <laughs> 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 I'll never forget the uh, Sanu Scout offered me one of those uh, big um, sweets that you get in the rat pack, those orange sweets. He gave me one of those to suck. <laughs> and uh, he was just so grateful that we pulled him out. And um, then we we're going to head back to Terezi, jumped in the helicopter, and it wouldn't start. And now I'm thinking. Have you done something? I'm the one that's got to fix this. Right? <laughs> and the starting cycle on a, on a helicopter is very complicated. And it was when computers had first c come out on helicopters, a thing called a mobile block. And uh, this thing had little relays and switches all over the place and they had a light sequence. And I was told that if you get an orange, a green, and a red, and a red, and a green, and an orange, and all these sequences meant different things. And I also knew that when things went wrong, you, if you just got a, hammer, a little <laughs> screwdriver hammer and you tap different parts of the engine, <laughs> selected parts of the engine, uh, the engine would, would start. So I, I, I actually was flummoxed. I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I said to Willie, uh, what was the light sequence? And he's trying to think. Ah, it was an orange and a green and a red or whatever. Oh, okay. And I jumped on top of the helicopter and I, 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 I whacked on the mobile block and I whacked on the pump or whatever. And, okay, try that. And the helicopter started. And, of course, Willie really? thought I'm, I'm now, and Willie now thinks I'm the <laughs> top, uh, top engineer. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we got back and... I, 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 there's so many things that happened at Bush Trip that I'll just give you a quick price. Uh, um, after that, um, we did a few uh, we did a few fire force ops with the SAS, and I sort of got got uh, more and more comfortable how, how um, fire force worked. And then, just before Christmas, about the 20, 20, 20th or the twenty first of December, nineteen seventy five. Uh, they decided to have an HDF in the Bangala Dam area and um, an HDF is when you just flood the whole area with, with troops and OPs all over the place and, uh, and everybody's out looking for terrorists. It's, there was RAR, uh, RAR and uh, Salute Scouts all over the place uh, looking. We were sent to Bangala Dam where we camped at the runway at Bangala Dam and it was really raining that night and uh, some SAS guys came across and we were swapping uh, as my, myself, Mario Venuti and Ron Nelson were the engineers, the pilots were with uh, all the officers on the other side and we were swapping rat packs with the SAS guys and shooting shit with them and just being them and uh, it was really cold and, and wet, they had their bivvies next to us and then uh, we had an early night, 5 o'clock the next morning we uh, Salute uh, Scouts uh, spotted some terrorists up on, on the hill just above the, 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 uh, the runway where we were. Uh, we got airborne fl flying around and uh, John Blathwood was flying in K-Car. Uh, Prop Keldnos was there in the links with uh, Funny enough, Graham Wilson wasn't in the K car, he was in the links with Prop. They did uh, some airstrikes. John had the Goop's visual, they were 
they were uh, with Doug, John was with Doug Sinclair. They were firing at, at the, the Goots, and I was we were flying in a wide orbit with Willie Knight, and the other G cars also in a wide orbit. And then it's only a helicopter. And then uh, and then um, John spoke us onto an LZ on the side of the hill, and uh, I, I had a. Um, Torty King, Steve Seymour, and Budnell, and some other guys on, on my on my helicopter. We dropped them off, and uh, and uh, this adds to obvious. Yeah. And uh, they went into they went into an extended stop line next to a big uh, log up on the hill. We we blew off the hill and we were flying around, and I could hear John saying. Saying to them, I, I think they were stop four. I think stop four, stop four. The go the gooks are, are coming up the hill towards you. Be, uh, get ready, get ready, and and flying around in, in this orbit, I, there was just the most in, just fire all over the place. And uh, and then all I could hear on the radio is, I'm it, I'm it, I'm it, I'm it, and. Uh, it was Tor Torty King's call sign, um, mm -hmm. and uh, John John uh, couldn't fire. They couldn't fire uh, at the at the at the enemy because of the thick bush, uh, lots of gondi trees, I think. And um, Willie <coughs> Willie got spoken straight into the closest LZ to where the stick was, and uh, I think they'd been taken out by an RPD gunner. That, that stood up to see what was happening, and uh, they, 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 they just in the wrong, uh, the wrong thing to do. And uh, Willie put us down, and he and he said to me, "Beaver, you've got to go and help. You, you, you just go, go." And I, I jumped out the the G car, and I grabbed my FN, and I cocked it a wooden cock. It was just full of sand from from dust and stuff. And he just threw me his FN. And I, I cocked it. It was okay, and, and that was it. He was he just blew off the sun because obviously it was it was a real hot area. Now he has me with a bone dome on, flak vest on, and what the fuck? What? <clears throat> and and I knew where I knew where the where the call sign was. So I started running. I just ran, and I was running like hell. And all all I could hear um, through my helmet was just. My, obviously my own breathing and then just this oh. intense intense gunfire uh, the, the, the double tap from the from the k car uh, the, the the noise of the rpd just mm -hmm. and and i was seeing all this dust and stuff coming in i didn't know at the time what it was but it was actually uh, he, he was having a go at me and when i'm running with my flak vest on and it's bumping against my chest. It's heavy as hell, and I'm, I'm just running. Uh, I, I'd taken a stretcher, but I, I tossed the stretcher, and I, I got to, I got to where these guys were, and they were sort of lying in a little semicircle. And you cannot believe the carnage that I saw that day. That I will never forget it for the rest of my life. They were lying on top of their guns, and there was just like, uh, there was like. Uh, plasma and stuff, and their guns were stuck with plasma. Torch had been shot through the elbow here. Another round had gone through his eye, and he was just, you know, he, I th thought he was still alive. But, uh, and Steve Seymour was dead, but didn't look too great either. And, uh, <clears throat> and then the two, the two of us uh, uh, grabbed each guy uh, one by one by the, uh, put them in the, uh, in their sleeping bag, on top of their sleeping bags, and we dragged them to to the helicopter and got them out. So that was just intense. And uh, go going back, uh, well, I think we killed five for, for the loss of all those guys. We we, we killed five five of the of the terrorists. So it was yeah, it wasn't day. it wasn't it was a tough day and a, a day that I'll never forget. But uh, there's one thing about it uh, that I always said to Torty that I'll always keep an eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Du bist die Lost, der da. Ja. <lacht> anyway, Tochi and I are still, uh, still, and I still uh, friends to this day. And funny enough, Tochi's, uh, some of Tochi's uh, cousins were in Seven Squadron with me. Pat oh, Kenny, really? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, after, after, I'll just finish off with this one. After that, we got, uh, within two or three days, we got called out again, and it was when Vic Cook had been shot down. Uh, when he got his bronze cross, when he jumped out, w when he when he jumped out and, and shot the goop with his, uh, but we we can cover that in another story some other time. And uh, Finch, let's do. And Finch was Finch was shot through through the side. Okay. Okay. Um, Beaver, uh, I know Seven Squadron. You you spent a lot of time on fire force operations. It's, a, it's an area of great interest to a lot of people. And we've had old Don Price, who you remember, um, giving us the, the story from, from a soldier's point of view. Um, be nice to have you talk us through just the basic concept, how it worked for you guys in the Air Force. And um, some of the, I know you, you saw countless contacts um, in, in the fire, in course of fire force operations, but maybe just tell us a couple of um, stories that that stick in your mind from that from that period. But, uh, just a brief overview of the fire force concept from a from an airman's point of view. Okay, <coughs> fire force started off um, from up cauldron days when when there was few few helicopters and and aircraft but no one was really uh, coordinated the radio the, the radio um, channels were different there were many things there were, we made many mistakes in the beginning but uh, it was all a big learning curve basically evolved into it, it evolved into a thing where uh, you'd have a You'd have a, a K car, which was the uh, a gunship, um, either armed with a 20 millimeter cannon or a four Browning, uh, four 303 Brownings, which was uh, called the Dalmatian. And then there'd be between, depending on, on the on the availability of aircraft, sometimes one K car, one G car, or it could a G car was basically a a, a, a slick, as the Americans call it, a, a, and a, 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 a G car carried, in the early days, carried five troops, but uh, the gearboxes on the helicopter couldn't handle the, the, the weight, so um, the gearboxes were upgraded and we, we changed, and in those days it was called a brick, and then it changed to a, what we called a stick, and the stick was consisted of four troops. Uh, so a fire force would have a gun, always have a gunship, and it, it would have between say two, two and, and six G cars. A normal fire force, uh, um, I think, would probably consist of one K car and four G cars because of of the amount of forward air forward airfields that they operated out of. Um, Rhodesia, Rhodesia was uh, had uh, forward airfields all over, over, over. We had about eight forward airfields in Rhodesia, you know, where Fire Force was based. And Fire Force was normally based where there was a Jock Joint Operational Command, which was also a concept that came out of Malaya, where the, the army, the police, and the Air Force, and all security forces would. Uh, Combined and decisions would be made as, as a as a combined op. op. Um, Tell us about a typical fire force call out. Okay, a fire, sorry, I'll just add one thing. The fire force also had fix, a fixed wing complement, which was normally a Cessna C337 Lynx. In the early days, it would be a Provost, but the Provost uh, just got too old. So we replaced them with the with the links, and the links could 
could drop, uh, it had uh, uh, rockets, it had, uh, it had uh, napalm, which was called Fran, and it had, uh, it had HE bombs, uh, golf bombs, and, and uh, they, they were pretty tooled up and very, very effective. There were, the other complement to the Fire Force was uh, the DC-3 Dakota uh, that supplemented us with, uh, because we never had enough helicopters to deploy, we, we would use the, the Dakota and uh, would drop sticks out of the D Dakota, uh, which also worked very well. And you had to be pretty brave to be a Fire Force troopy uh, jumping out of ducks because the normal operational height of jumping in, in, a, in a hot LZ, into a hot LZ would be between three and four hundred feet, and sometimes I think it's even the guys that jump from even lower. So yes, it was um, it was something. Just uh, talk us through a typical call out. Okay, scenario. what what would happen? What would happen? There'd just be a normal day at the FAF, start off with the RLI going for a run or, or the RAR going for, they'd, they'd run in sticks and, and uh, sing while they were singing, normally singing uh, abusive stuff to the blue jobs <laughs> because uh, they, they, their accommodation wasn't as plush as, as ours and that, that was always a bone of contention. Bone of contention. Uh, I still think the police had better accommodation than <laughs> everybody, but, but that's uh, room for debate there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it would start off with them going for their morning run. Uh, we, at that time, first light, we would push the helicopters out of revetments. Um, we had them in revet. We had revetments made out of uh, 44 gallon drums filled with uh, soil, with big gun poles above and wire mesh to stop the mortar bombs from from actually if, if, a, if you were mortared and a mortar bomb came over over where the helicopter was parked uh, the fins would catch in the, in the mesh that was the idea and it, apparently it worked pretty good anyway we'd push the helicopters out out the revetments the helicopters were always uh, ready to go um, they were fully fueled fully armed and uh, They'd be pushed into a, into their lines uh, um, next to the revetments, and everybody would carry continue their normal day, whatever the, the, the troops would do, whatever training they needed to do, or we would we would do servicing, and the pilots would be playing cards or whatever. And then um, the, the the surrounding areas would be, uh, if it was a frozen frozen area, there'd be Salu scouts. In the area, no other military personnel, and they'd be based in, in. They'd either be patrolling or they'd be in observation posts, looking for for any terrorist activity. Which uh, most fire force, most fire force uh, callouts were to feedings. So fire force callouts were either very early in the morning or at lunchtime, or sometimes in the evening. But that was a problem because. Light, light would, everything uh, revolved around light. The OPs would be looking out, and if, as soon as they saw lots of women with uh, with uh, food on their heads and stuff, and plates and stuff, they'd, they'd normally go into thick riverine areas, and, and most fire force activities were next to a village, or, or next to a river, or next to a big copy line. And, um, it, it actually, actually became quite easy to look for them because you just look for path patterns going into the bush. And uh, anyway, the Salu Scouts would see all this, or the, or the RAR or, or independent company, whoever was doing the OP would spot the gooks. They'd call Fire Force, they'd, they'd, they'd tell Fire Force that the, the, the amount of terrorists they've got visual, what clothing they're wearing, what weapons they're wearing, what the local population are doing. Uh, they'd give them as, as, as much information as they could and then ComOps would, this info would go to ComOps, ComOps would make the call and uh, w once the call had been made, they'd, uh, the, the hooter would go 
the siren would go, which was always the worst thing in your life because it was just, you, you could never prepare yourself for it. It was always like that big adrenaline and, uh, rush when, when the hooter went. For us engineer techs, we'd run to our helicopters, we'd um, pull all the, all the covers off. Uh, once the, call, the, the com ops had approved the call out, the siren would, would go, the pilots would run to the ops room for, and for uh, whatever briefing they, they, could, uh, they could get. Sometimes there was no time for, for briefing and ops, ops room would say we'll brief you while you're airborne depending on the severity. Sometimes it could be a hot extraction or, or, or the, the troops are on the ground are, are in, a, in a contact already. So uh, it, it was very flexible. Um, anyway, one, the pilots would go for the briefing. We'd prepare the helicopters, and normally the sticks would come to, would would go to the uh, uh, allocated helicopters. Everybody would wait. Pilot would, uh, and the, the the pilot and the uh, sticks would jump, would jump into the aircraft, and we'd we'd I'd, I'd walk around, do the start up, and then KCAR would would call and do a radio check on all the aircraft and we'd, and we'd, we'd blow off as quickly as we could. There was no time for, for even having a wee or anything. You had to go. It was, when it was time to go, you were gone. There was no, no delay. Uh, because they were so heavy, we'd normally, uh, we'd normally do a running takeoff take on, the, on, the, on the runway with a nose wheel on the ground trying to get translation, uh, translational lift, get airborne and uh, <coughs> KCAR leading and uh, everybody, in, everybody uh, uh, behind KCAR. Once the, the, the fire force was deployed, that's, that's the, the, the helicopters, the gunships and the, and the Lynx. The Lynx would act as Telstar and he would he would call on ahead with, and make comms with the call sign on the ground and get as much information as he could and relay it to KCAR and um, we, the GCARs would just listen in and get as much information as they could. In, on board the helicopters the, um, the stick leaders had a headset so they could also listen in and get a gist of what was going on and then brief their, their troops once they that whenever they had the opportunity to do so. Um, once, when you're five minutes out, the KCAR would pull up and the call sign on the ground would, would, call, him, would call him onto the target. He'd, he'd, say, he'd say, fly straight, turn left, turn left, turn right, overhead now, whatever. Uh, and he, he, he um, He'd position the KCAR directly over the contact area and our job as an engineer was to drop a, a huge smoke grenade uh, the moment um, either, if either we saw the, the terrorists on the ground or we were over the target area we because we, we, we always needed a reference point. So the smoke, these smoke generators lasted for a long time and you could see them in the GCARs uh, circling around and it was a, a good so whatever happened from then it would be from the smoke at 50 drop 20 uh, the smoke was your target your target the moment smoke was dropped the, 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 it was the KCAR gunner's job to try and knock down as much of the enemy as he could in that initial because that's when the ter terrorists would bomb shell and that they, they, they would normally just completely bombshell in, 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 and because that that go to a crash RV. Uh, normally it would be on a river line and that they would go up the river line, down the river line and uh, we, we drop stops. That, that's where the KCAR, uh, army commander on, there was an army commander on KCAR and the KCAR uh, pilot. Um, sometimes the army commander didn't have much experience so the KCAR uh, pilot would would uh, would run the whole scene for the for the army guy. Um, it, it wasn't for any other reason, but he just knew. It, you know, we did it so many times that uh, we, we were had it 
you really take. Um, and then you drop stop stop groups uh, around the, the target area to, to try and contain the breakout of, of the terrorists. The duck would be flying around, and uh, and um, if if required, he he uh, he'd also uh, drop drop his his stops. Uh, funny thing about the ducks is um, they used to have a. A stick called the wanker sticks. Two guys on the stick were normally the two uh, bad guys that are, that they got drunk the like, week before, or, or, or they were un under punishment. The rest of the sticks would join the, the firefight, and the uh, wanker sticks had to pick up the parachutes. And uh, and uh, it's amazing how many times the wanker sticks actually had the first contact. <laughs> anyway, it was very efficient and very fast. And and uh, and it could be pretty brutal. Um, and the, the, those RAR and RLI guys, I take my hat off to them. They were incredible. The the um, stamina they had, um, mm -hmm. just running up and down those those copies and stuff in Rhodesia, it was it was incredible to, to see them mm -hmm. in action. And the whole thing from the KCAR point of view was like a chess game. It was. I, I, I must say that in all my years on, on Fire Force, it, it, it was really very interesting watching how different people react to, to different scenarios and, and uh, the, our, our, our pilots were just incredible with them, their map reading mm -hmm. and uh, just how cool they were under fire. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a time before GPS's, I mean, everything was on maps. Yes, yeah, so on 150 map. Yeah. 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 And they, they, used to have, they used to have bags and bags of maps yeah. next to them, and they'd just sit there, and he'd watch him, he'd run his fingers, yeah. and he'd be flying, running, trying to run the whole scene. You have the map there, and he'd be, he'd be on the ball. You'd know exactly where the, those guys were incredible. I know, I Their map reading skills. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those guys ended up. Uh, flying, flying as, cap, as uh, captain on yeah, major airlines, airlines and mm. stuff. I'm very proud of them. Yes. Um, yeah. Casavax, uh, Casavax. If somebody got shot, there was there was no holding back. We went in hot. Um, I remember one time with Mark Smithdorf, we we went into Matoka area. We went into we went and dropped our troops. As we dropped, as we were, as we were flaring to drop our troops, I saw that I saw about six terrorists lying on their backs with their AKs, just pumping rounds into our helicopter. Hit the rotor blades, came back through the cabin, and uh, and we we blew out of there. I don't know how we managed to get away without being shot because I could see the whites of their eyes. And within five minutes, we were back in an, we were back in the same LZ, picking up a Kazabek. It, it was incredible. Um, for the RLI guys, um, yeah, we were there for you. We, uh, what can I say? <laughs>